Schultz, director of the Wallace Center at Windrock International, to welcome you to our webinar today. Hey everybody, it's good to be back with you on the webinar series. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about the Wallace Center. Um, we're a program group at Windrock International and the host of the National Good Food Network webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in this movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 30 years. Uh, today, we focus on supporting entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that's healthier for people, the environment, and the economy. We serve a growing community of civic, business, philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we're focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food that's healthy, green, fair, and affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, as you can imagine, is a key initiative of the Wallace Center that illustrates our market-based strategy with the goal of moving more good food to more people. So back to you, Jeff. Thanks, John. Um, the National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It's structured as a network of networks to ensure efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and then back down to the grassroots level uh, across the nation. And the Wall Center coordinates and supports this network. The NGFN goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there is abundant supply of good food to meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can learn more about the great work of the National Good Food Network on our website, ngfn.org, and feel free to contact us at any time using that email address. John? So part of the NGFN is, is the Food Hub collaboration. And uh, the Food Hub collaboration really focuses on that key piece of, of what might be called the value chain for regional food systems, which would be a food hub uh, that helps work with growers to aggregate product, but also, also helps growers uh, and that product get into scaled up markets. Um, the Food Hub collaboration has multiple components to it, all kind of circling around the community of practice, we have networking, uh, we do research, technical assistance, uh, we work deeply with a set of hubs we call our study hubs and other regionally based food hubs, uh, all to bring um, greater information to a variety of communities including practitioners, researchers, philanthropy, and policy makers. Uh, we're joined in the collaboration uh, with the Center for Regional Food Systems at Michigan State, USDA Ag Marketing Service, the Farm Credit Council, Wholesome Wave Foundation, uh, the National Farm to School Organization and School Food Focus. Uh, together we coordinate and um, uh, find where the synergies are in order to move regional food systems forward. So with that, uh, let me introduce uh, our presenter today, uh, Salani Doshi with the New Venture Advisors, um, focusing on appropriate technology for businesses and uh, food hubs of course being one of those but not certainly not the only business in the regional food value chain. Uh, Salani was most recently uh, a co-founder and co-CEO of Fresh Taste Kitchen which is a for-profit social venture making healthy eating accessible to low-income individual and family customers through a meal delivery service marketed and distributed through partnering community organizations such as schools, churches, and recreation centers. Before that that she worked as a strategy and operations consultant for Oliver Wyman where she drove product optimization, procur procurement and staffing strategies for Fortune 100 countries, companies, countries, companies. As you can see that she's uh, had her hands both in the strategy and in the tactical pieces so we're fortunate to have her today. She also has an, an MBA from Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. Uh, with all that she combines her keen interest in sustainable agriculture, local food systems and food access as a leader of the important contributor to New Venture Associate Studies and Business Plans. So with that, let me turn it over to Saloni to uh, make the presentation today. Excellent. Hi, everybody. I'm looking forward to talking to you today. And as um, both Jeff and John have described, I'll be um, talking today about how to help you choose the appropriate technology to run your business. 
So the core objectives that I'm hoping to cover today are to really lay the initial foundations that are going to, that are going to help food hubs really assess your technology needs, structure a search for the right technology solutions, and evaluate and select the right technology solutions for your needs. Um, this is a really complex process, and my hope in this hour is not to solve it for you, but to help you wrap your hand, hands around what might feel very, um, again, complex and intimidating. I do want to be clear about what we're not doing today. So we won't be evaluating specific software systems today. Uh, we're not troubleshooting specific challenges that you might be having with an existing software provider or discussing how you would best work with the, the software provider. Those are very important topics that we aren't covering in this, uh, in this hour session, but um, may, might be something you want to pursue doing at another time. So um, John gave a great initial background on me. I just wanted to highlight a couple things about my background that make me the right person to lead this initial discussion. So um, as you mentioned, I've been a strategy consultant for many years. Currently, I'm an associate with New Venture Advisors, and New Venture Advisors is a, a business development, development advisory firm that works with uh, public, private, and social sector clients on food hub planning and development projects. Uh, New Venture Advisors was launched in 2009 and since then has helped in the planning and development of 20 food hubs and has directly led to the launch of five food hubs that are currently in operation with many more in their planning phases. Um, prior to that, at Oliver Wyman, I also worked with many uh, technology companies, helping them develop features and functionality for their system. And I also worked with everybody from sort of airlines, large domestic airlines, to healthcare startups to help them understand what technology they wanted to bring on board. Um, as John mentioned, I'm a food entrepreneur myself. I ran a social venture called Fresh Takes Kitchen. We were purchasing, producing, and distributing um, healthy prepared meals. Uh, in that role, I, I have a feeling I may be in the, the boat of, I may have been in the boat that many of you guys are in right now, which is, you know, I remember when we first launched, we had, were knee deep in 10 different Excel spreadsheets, and each spreadsheet was helping us manage different parts of our business. Um, and then we really had to pull it together when I realized I was tired of knocking my head against the wall trying to manage those documents and realized that it was time for us to invest in a real solution. So in that role, I was, um, it, again, the evaluator and user of tech systems myself. Um, and then most recently and most relevant to this presentation, um, last fall, Wholesome Wave um, in their work, within their direct work with many food hubs around the country, um, has began to realize that technology was coming up again and again as a really key challenge that um, they were facing. And so Wholesome Wave um, asked New Venture Advisors to do a um, basically an in-depth study to and, and to develop a toolkit that would help food hubs really systematically assess their technology needs and start to address this challenge they were having. Um, and that toolkit that I developed was, is the basis of this presentation today. So just to clear just what I'm not. So I'm not a technology entrepreneur myself, nor am I a developer or programmer myself. Um, and I'm not a food hub operator or a grower. And these are really important perspectives that you know, may be very important for you to access as you're going about your technology selection process. And I just wanted to be clear up front that those are not perspectives that I personally have. Um, all right, so I wanted to just share a little bit about what I heard about you all from the pre-registration survey that you guys took. Um, the first is that the majority of you were, are um, food hub operators in some form. There are also quite a few nonprofits, um, as well as um, some producers on the call. And then there's also several advisory firms or technical assistance providers um, and funders on the call. And I wanted to be clear that I've really designed this presentation to be most relevant for food hubs um, and, and those organizations that are in direct support of food hubs. We also asked in the, um, the pre-registration survey what technology solutions you guys are currently using. And it was really exciting for me to see that they were across the board. Um, so many of you have what I would call sort of tactical in-house solutions. So in the lower left-hand side of this quadrant, these are solutions that um, so where basically you are likely using a series of Excel spreadsheets, uh, maybe one Excel spreadsheet to manage your customer database, maybe another to uh, manage your buyers, and maybe another to manage your inventory. And you're doing maybe a lot of manual work to integrate data and to share data across those 
system. Um, I say it's tactical because what I mean by that is that you have a specific uh, document or a database for each function, um, and it's in-house because you're using these solutions, but you're customizing them to meet your own needs. Some of you seem to also have migrated to the upper left-hand uh, part of the quadrant, where you're still quote-unquote tactical in that you're looking at different solutions for different functions, but maybe you're outsourcing some of it. So you've started to adopt QuickBooks or specific QuickBook modules to um, help you focus on certain functionality. Maybe you've um, started to use Salesforce um, to do some customer relationship management or using WordPress um, and some of their add-ins for your website and for e-commerce. And then it seems like some of you have made, started to make some big or small investments in what's called an ERP system, so an enterprise resource planning system that not just addresses single functionality but actually addresses the majority of needs across your business, so a single system that might be dealing with purchasing, inventory, invoicing, logistics, e-commerce, all in one system. Um, some of these systems are all-inclusive, and some of them still have pieces of functionality they don't cover. So you might also be using QuickBooks on top of that. And then finally, it looks like some of you are um, have gone down the line of investing in an in in-house system. So maybe you found that nothing off the shelf is meeting your needs, and it, it made sense because your model was so unique to invest in your own development of an in-house solution that, again, addresses many needs across the business. Um, I've designed this presentation to be, I think, most helpful for folks who are on the left-hand side of the screen. So folks who are still early on and maybe haven't made any major software investments, or for folks who are on the right side of the screen but feel like maybe they need to backtrack and revisit the investments that they've made. So you are now um, about to launch into a technology search, let's say. Um, here are sort of four philosophical tenets that I think might be important to keep in mind when you're approaching your search. So the first is that you know, technology should be an enabler of your business strategy, but recognize that it's not the solution. So it's definitely not going to, if you have operational or strategic challenges at a business level, Technology is generally not going to be the silver bullet that addresses them all. It can make life a lot easier, make processes more efficient, and can save you time or money. Uh, but it's not going to be the strategic answer to many of the challenges that you might be facing. Um, the second, as we're building on that, is that oftentimes I find that investments in technology are best made after strategic and operational foundations of a business are stable. So what I mean by that is that oftentimes there might be uh, a new food, maybe you have a new food hub that's just getting into operations and you feel like you have a concrete vision for what you're going to be. Let's say you're a food hub that is going to, that is, that whose focus will be to aggregate produce and sell direct to consumers. Oftentimes we find in startups that what happens is six to 12 months down the line, you make some changes. So then let's say uh, six to 12 months down the line, you find that there's actually quite a few wholesale buyers that are interested in purchasing from you and or that you need some wholesale purchases in order to make your food hub financially viable. Well, if that's the case, then if you had already invested in a software solution that's really focused on the end consumer as your customer, then you might have to backtrack and make some significant changes once you find that wholesale is going to be an important customer as well. So, you know, as you're starting out, I think it's really important to just get some of the basic, again, operations and strategy of your business truly foundational and, and stable before you make these large investments. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that technology should be adapted to meet a business process's needs, um, not vice versa. So what I mean by that is that let's say you you have a really um, great process for working with your buyers where how buyers are, are making or submitting their orders to you. It doesn't make sense to then take a technol in, uh, implement a technology that's going to completely change how you're working with your buyers if the process is working for you. So really think about you know where there where do you need to customize the technology so that it fits into your business's processes needs rather than fitting your processes to the technology that you have in mind. And then the fourth is just you know don't waste time reinventing the wheel. There um, are quite there's a lot of exciting progress happening in the local food technology landscape, and there's a lot of innovations and new systems coming out almost, you know, every couple months it seems like there's some new exciting systems coming out. And so, you know, definitely think twice before you go to doing an in-house solution. 
um, because doing an, creating your own in-house solution, even if that seems like an option you want to pursue, just recognize the amount of resources that would go into it and the fact that there are some experts, so many experts out there creating great systems already that you, you likely can use something off the shelf. You back up a slide, Ashley. Um, so, the, this presentation will be covering functionality needs in particular. So, we're going to be talking most in most detail about how you assess what your functionality needs are. It's important to keep in mind, however, that there are many other criteria to think about when you're selecting your software solution. Um, so an important one is going to be ease of use. So how easy is it and efficient is it for you to use and your team, but also potentially growers and buyers if those growers and buyers are also going to use this uh, software. Pricing structure is also something to keep in mind. Um, some software is going to be sold at a, a monthly or quarterly subscription basis. Others might be charging a percentage of revenue and others might be a per user licensing fee. And they each have really different implications on the total cost, but also on your cash flow and ability to pay for it. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, then there's the total cost of ownership. So not only what is what are you going to be charged for the software upfront and ongoing, but what are some other cost um, cost factors? So maybe you have to maybe your staff has to get trained in the software um, and that's going to take up some time or maybe you have to purchase some hardware. So that's definitely something to keep in mind as well. Um, sort of platform and architecture, so, so there's you know, cloud-based systems out there, and there's also systems that would be on your desktop. Um, and the cloud-based systems are oftentimes great at allowing for a dispersed network of users to utilize the system. Um, they're oftentimes easier to deploy, and they don't require that you have any data in your system. Um, on the flip side, some people find the desktop systems are you know, easier to use, um, or slightly more reliable, so there's some pros and cons to each. Um, sort of open source versus closed, so open source technology means that there's generally sort of free access to the coding behind a technology, and some people have a preference for open source systems because there's oftentimes a large pool of developers that uh, might be interested in creating modules or add-ons for it, um, or they might just be philosophically more aligned with the concepts of open source and technology. And then there's the closed system, um, which people may, may be more excited about sometimes because closed systems tend to oftentimes be, have more stable upfront funding um, and a much cleaner relationship that you can have with your technology provider. Um, important to think about data and IP ownership, so who owns your data and who has access to it and how can you make sure that you're protecting it. Um, how well does your system integrate, so how well does the system that you're looking at integrate with um, you know, other modules, maybe you're still going to use QuickBooks, so how well does it integrate with QuickBooks? Or how well does it integrate with your buyer's or grower system, if that's going to be an important piece of functionality. You want to think about the deployment approach. So how, um, how is the software provider going to work with you to customize the solution, if at all, and then to train your staff and any other users on the system. Um, you're going to want to think about how are they maintaining security and the protection of your data so that you know there's no data leakages issues. Um, also want to think about responsiveness and flexibility. How easy is this provider to work with? How great is their customer service? How willing and able are they to be able to respond to your needs? Um, and then finally, you're going to think about you know the overarching measure, which is return on investment. So what impact is this software going to have on your business? To what extent is it going to be able to help you grow your business and increase your profitability. Um, and we'll, we'll touch back on return on investment towards the end of the presentation. So and I'm going to walk you through sort of a step-by-step, high-level step-by-step of what the technology search process looks like. Um, the first step is for you guys to assemble a team. So think through, you know, what kind of expertise do you want on the team of people who are going to be part of the decision-making process to identify and select a technology. You'll likely want to include somebody who really understands the, the core sort of nitty-gritty operations of your, of your food hub. You're also likely going to want to um, engage people who are dealing with whatever technology solutions you have in place right now. Um, somebody who has an eye toward your budget and your financial planning will be really helpful. 
and then also you know the people you assume will be using the system. So either within in within your organization, um, but also if you anticipate growers or buyers are going to be using them, you might want to engage them as well. Um, if there is budget for it, you might want to think about seeking some outside counsel, um, firms like New Venture Advisors or a, a list of other technical assistance providers that Wallace has in their database could be interesting to, to work with as well. Once you identify that expertise, you're going to want to select the you know, specific individuals who you think have the capacity, um, the sort of resources and time to, to focus on this and, and are interested and able to, and then establish their roles. So, not everybody has to be part of every process. Likely you'll want to have one person who's the project manager of this entire decision-making process, um, and then other people who might just step in when you're defining your requirements, or might just step in when you're actually doing some user testing, or will be there to make the final decision. Then you'll conduct a really comprehensive needs assessment. The first two boxes here in terms of, say, build a process flow, and then develop your functional requirements. This is going to, I'm not going to touch on this in a lot of detail because the next several slides get into it at great length. Um, but then the third box you'll see it says ideal state for other needs. So in addition to defining your functionality, you'll also want to define the ideal state for the other needs that I just described in the previous slide. So everything from pricing structure to um, customer service to usability. The end stage of this needs assessment would be basically a full functionality, a list of functionality that you're looking for, the prioritization of each of those pieces of functionality, and a list of other needs that you might have. And you'll then use that to go into building a pipeline and doing the research. So building a pipeline of what the solutions are out there that you want to consider. Um, there's going to be some an initial list at the end of this presentation that can be helpful. Uh, I'd also recommend that you do some basic Google searching and also connect with other food hubs and food hub networks um, and other technical assistance providers to see what ideas they have to build that full list. And then you can assess features, first maybe doing some cursory research, again, looking at their websites and doing online sort of um, demos that they might have on their websites, and then set up meetings with the software providers and walk them through what your requirements are and have them describe their features and give you demos, uh, live demos of their systems. And this is also the stage where you may consider in-house development. If you're finding that you know, really it seems like nothing off the shelf is going to meet your needs, this is a stage where you might want to say, okay, let's also determine or do some due diligence to understand what it would mean to develop a solution in-house for ourselves. And then finally, you'll go through an in-depth evaluation and selection process. So one of the best ways to evaluate a software is to, a lot of times, providers will give you a free trial. And so to take them up on that and to deploy a free trial of one, two, or three software solutions you might be really considering, um, getting really deep into them, um, getting your data in, getting the users that you've identified in the first step of this process to you know, get into the weeds of the software, and then gather, gather feedback from the team members and then develop a model to assess the return on investment of those solutions and evaluate them side by side. And again, um, as I've said, we're going to really spend the bulk of the, the rest of the slides talking first about the two boxes under needs assessment, um, helping you guys build out your functionality list, and then talking about how you evaluate uh, software using an ROI return on investment model. So what do I mean by build process flow? Um, I think it's important and that you guys are, all know this, but you know, the term food hub is a, is a broad term that describes a myriad of business types. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen that there is you know, quite a few, there are five different food hubs that um, are, are all very different from each other, not just geographically, but in their actual business model, who they sell to, how they aggregate, whether or not they have a physical facility, if they do processing or not. Um, and the right side of the screen just highlights five somewhat common business models within the food hub space. So you've got your traditional aggregator model, and those are businesses that are um, purchasing and aggregating products from growers in a physical warehouse and selling that product to buyers. Um, you've got processors that are buying the product and then creating value, buying pro pro uh, different raw inputs and creating value-added products to sell to buyers. Um, you have that broker sales agent model. Um, where those are entities that are oftentimes, they may not have physical warehouse facilities, but are really existing to um, sell, uh, sell to and 
create a sales and market their sales and marketing arm that are selling to end buyers and then um, identifying the supply amongst their grower base that can be used to fulfill orders. Um, then you've got that e-commerce or marketplace model where you know really the food hub is most importantly a portal that is directly connecting growers to end customers. Um, and then there's a CSA aggregator sort of model where food hub is um, selling weekly maybe weekly produce boxes to end customers and is filling those orders uh, but through aggregation from local growers. So there's just five five business models really just to show that um, you know you'll see different food hub software and you'll see different um, technology providers out there but it's important to first think about what is it that your business is all about before you go and identify which software solution is going to meet your needs. So how do you go about building process flow? The first is to sit down with that team that you've assembled and to just you know sit down and describe like what is your vision and mission as a business? What are your core operations and revenue stream? And just sort of put it in paragraph form for yourself. Then list out all of the different functions that um, exist as part of your day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year operations as a business. So in this left box, I've listed a couple or several that you know are likely re that may or may not be relevant to you, but you know crop pre Pre-season crop planning, during season, maybe weekly grower communication, sales and marketing to buyers, purchasing from growers, receiving product from growers, your inventory management, um, your order fulfillment, so actually filling and packing orders in your warehouse, um, the logistics, so your end delivery of products to uh, of orders to buyers, all of the accounting and financial management and food safety. So those are just a set of potential functions that I found were really common when talking to food hubs. Then for each of those functions, you're going to sit down and actually define the process. So think through how is that function currently executed? What are the steps that are involved? And who, are, who is actually involved in each step? And then how currently is information gathered, used, and shared in each of those steps? And then you're going to want to think, what technology solutions are currently being used to support each step? So what is being used to track, use, and share data for that step? What non-technology solutions are being used? Maybe you're actually just recording things on pen and paper and st stocking them in binders or something like that and not really using any technology. That's also important to keep in mind. Um, and then who are the users of these solutions? And how are you really sharing that information, again, between the users of these solutions? So there's quite a bit on this slide. Um, the next two slides that I'm going to walk you through um, start to try to put meat and make this a lot more tangible. So they really, there's two visual schematics of process flow um, that help to turn what's on this slide into a reality. So first we're going to walk through a process flow example for um, what I would call a traditional brick and mortar food hub that is buying uh, produce from grow, local growers, aggregating that produce and selling it into wholesale buyers. So I'm just going to walk step by step through um, what what the various what it means to do a process flow for a company like this. So first, this company is the Food Hub is engaging in pre-season crop planning. So the Food Hub is calling for their buyers and calling their growers at the beginning of the season to understand you know what are their buyer demands. What do they anticipate needing next year? And then what capacity and supply does a grower, do their growers anticipate having next year? And what are the gaps? This particular food hub, let's say, is doing most of that. Again, they're making calls and they're recording all this information on an Excel spreadsheet. Then each week, um, the food hub is um, doing weekly in-season updates with their growers. So they're literally calling their growers each week to get a sense of what's coming on the pike. And um, they're generally recording this in an Excel spreadsheet as well. They're using this information to create weekly price lists for their buyers that are generated in Excel and then printed out and emailed out to their buyers. The price list has a list of available products or prices. And again, this is based on the uh, anticipated grower supply and whatever inventory they have in, in, their, in their food hubs as well. The food hub is then um, ordering from growers via purchase orders that are um, generated in QuickBooks. When using, they're using QuickBooks to generate purchase orders that they're then emailing or faxing or calling their growers with. 
Um, and these purchase orders they're developing based on their current inventory, um, their just-in-time um, orders that they need to fill, and then their forecasted supply, and then based on the in-season updates that they've gotten from their growers. Growers are then um, getting product to Food Hub. Either they're either dropping it off or it's getting picked up from their farm. The Food Hub at receiving is verifying that the order matches the that the uh, product matches the purchase order and syncing it into their inventory. They're managing their inventory also on an Excel spreadsheet. So this is definitely a Food Hub. The example that I'm describing is a Food Hub where everything is sort of manually managed via Excel spreadsheets. Um, and then the Food Hub is making payments and reconciling. Um, with the growers, and they're doing that. They're doing all of their financial management via QuickBooks. And then on the other side, with the food hub and the buyers, buyers are calling in their sales orders for the most part. And then the food hub is using those sales orders to generate pick lists um, in their warehouse, where they're then packing, packing, checking, and loading orders, and then getting them out delivered to buyers. And buyers are also then making payments, and all of this is up with getting reconciled in QuickBooks. And three pieces, three sort of functions that are overarching um, are really important also. So the first is food safety and recall. So you know, managing temperatures, tracking lot numbers, and maintaining organic certification, all of that stuff. This particular food hub that I'm describing um, keeps all, does all of that on pen and paper in the warehouse and is tracking it in binders. Um, that, are, that are stored so that they can go reference them if they need to at a later date. Um, then there's the accounting and reporting, so you know, maintaining revenue, cost of goods, overhead costs, accounts receivable, and payable, and payroll. Um, and then also doing financial planning and, and sort of understanding how on track you are to your goals. Um, this particular food hub is doing that all via QuickBooks right now. Um, and then there's the CRM, so how well are you maintaining your, the pipeline of buyers and um, communication with buyers, and the, are you meeting the targets that you're sending with buyers? Um, and this particular food hub is not doing is is not using any software to, to support this. Is really just doing it through weekly meetings with their management team. So that's one process flow example again of a traditional brick and mortar facility. I'm just going to go through one other one, which this is an example of sort of a CSA aggregator. So a food hub that is selling weekly produce boxes to their end customers and filling those boxes based on um, with the supply from a dozen or so growers. So this food is also engaging in pre-season crop planning with their growers so they can understand generally how much supply can they anticipate. Um, then they are they have an online portal where they're doing their um, they're actually marketing their CSA to customers and telling their customers what their drop-off sites are and if there's any limitations, maybe they have to say you can't, after 200 customers, we can't have any more. Um, customers are then going onto this online portal to um, sign up for the weekly subscription, to manage their profile, and to do basic management for their weekly orders. So subbing in products, um, halting their service because they're going on vacation or something like that. And it's also where they're making payments. Um, so customers can, in this model, they can prepay, or they all prepay, but they can do so with a recurring credit card on file, or they can make a payment for each order that they're that they're making. Um, and then on the flip side, the Food Hub is working with growers to on in-season updates so that the Food Hub can understand, okay, what, what does it look like each week's box is going to look like, and what are the opportunities that customers might have to sub out, sub in products. Then the Food Hub is um, based on the weekly CSA numbers. They're submitting purchase orders to their growers. Um, receiving that product and also paying the growers. Um, and then each week once the CSA, the, the list of weekly CSA uh, customers is confirmed, they'll finalize their order fulfillment, they'll finalize the pick list, and then get it out to deliver to the site coordinator who's going to disperse it to those customers. This food hub also has to deal with similar issues around food safety and recall, accounting and reporting, and CRM. So those, again, are overarching pieces of functionality that um, are, again, overarching and not part of the flow of goods through the business, but um, are an umbrella on top of it. So I recognize that those were dense slides, but my purpose of those two slides was really to just put the meat and make more tangible the idea of building a process flow for your organization. 
um, this next slide starts to hopefully make it, this slide becomes clear and hopefully gives you a tangible starting point for doing these important steps of creating your requirements list. Um, so this is a template that I think will be really helpful um, for anybody out there who's looking to um, identify and select a technology solution. This is a really great way to get started in this process. So my recommendation is to create a table like this where your functions are in the left column. So each row in each row could be a function. So pre-season crop planning, um, uh, order of our grower communication, uh, sales and marketing with your buyers. So again, each row would be a specific function. And then for each of those functions, you want to think through how is the function executed, who is involved in each step, and how is information gathered, used, and shared in each step. So some of the stuff that I've presented in the schematics in the previous two slides. And you're going to want to think again what technology solutions are currently being used, what non-tech solutions are being used, and who are the users of these solutions. And then you're going to do the next two steps, which is really think through what would what would it look like in an ideal world. So in an ideal world, how would the step be automated? How could technology make it more efficient and effective? Who would the primary users of the data be and who are the inputters of that data be? Um, and then, you know, how important is this? What impact would the solution, technology solution, have on our business? And therefore, how high priority is it for us to um, pursue it? And then what's the quote-unquote trigger to make this high priority? And what might be the minimum, minimum requirement for now? So I can do sort of walk through an example, uh, maybe pre-season crop planning. In both of the example schematics that I just walked through, the pre-season crop planning process was a very manual one. As I said, the food hubs would just call buyers um, and understand what their demands are and then connect with growers and understand what their supply is, uh, they anticipate their supply to be, and then you know, reconcile any gap. Potentially, the food hub may sit down in doing this process and say, actually, we would love to automate the pre-season crop planning process. We would love to have our buyers and our growers fill out on a website, on an online portal, um, and actually fill out, here's what, here's what my anticipated supply is by crop type, um, by week, or by month, or whatever detail you want to get, and then have buyers fill out the same thing. And maybe this, this system then generates what are the gaps and what are the opportunities. So that could be a really great way to make more efficient and make more accurate a current process that's happening completely manually. So that would be maybe what the ideal state would look like. And then when you sit down and prioritize, you know, in terms of how would this solution benefit the business, there might be some really great ways that it would help the Food Hub um, identify untapped opportunities to sell additional supply, or it might help the Food Hub more accurately look for additional supply. So they might find, okay, well, if they could just find this additional supply, then they would have a sales, a sales outlet for it. Um, in terms of how high priority this, the technology is for the step and what's the trigger, Maybe the Food Hub sits back and says, you know what, this is a nice to have. It's not a high priority because right now we're only selling to six buyers and we're only aggregating from 10 growers and this is perfectly acceptable to manage manually. But we want to make sure we have this solution in place by the time we double our business. So that could be an important trigger. Or it might be, we want to make sure we have this solution in place by the time we get these two specific buyers who we know are very high volume. So it's just important to think through what that trigger point is. Um, and then they might decide that the minimum right now is nothing, that they actually, they're perfectly comfortable having a technology solution in place that at the initial onset doesn't address pre-season crop planning needs from, a, um, from an automation standpoint. So that's one example. Um, and you know, as you can see, you, can go, you should be going through this example for each function within your business. So now, now we've sort of made the jump. The previous slide talks through how you um, define your requirements list. Then there's all the work that you're going to do once you have your requirements list to actually go out and look for, you know, build your pipeline of software solutions, evaluate them. And now you're at a point where you're making a decision, um, which is the software solution you want to choose. So I want to just say a couple words about a return on investment evaluation approach. And so I think the most important thought here is that um, more than anything, you want to confirm and be confident that any solution that you invest in is going to result in increased the, the actual cost of that, sorry, the um, profitability implications, so the increase in your profitability as a result of the solution, either due to increased revenue or because you've cut costs out, 
is going to be higher than the total cost of that solution. And a great way to compare different software solutions is to understand, um, you know, what is this ratio and which of these uh, uh, software providers is going to give you a higher ratio of increase in income over total cost of solution. So I'll just say a couple um, words about the variables that sort of go into this. So the first is, if you think about total cost of ownership, you want to you wanna think about your acquisition price. So how much are you paying up front to get the solution? Um, and then what's the ongoing price? So for some, some sometimes you're just going to be paying a maintenance fee. Sometimes you're actually paying um, a subscription fee. So you're always going to be paying the same amount every month. And other times it's going to be a percentage of sale. So the amount that you're paying actually increases over time. And then, as I said earlier, you're also going to want to think about other costs. So what is your staff time that might be required to, to be trained? What are the hardware um, implications that you might need to purchase? Um, what is maybe the staff time you need to dedicate to training growers on, on a piece of software? So all of that should go into as you're thinking about the total cost of ownership of a solution. You also want to be thinking about sort of the implications of the cost and the pricing model. Um, so you know, are you able to pay up front? Um, and what's the ability and impact, sorry, what's the impact on your cash flow early on or longer term? Um, and then what does this mean for your implications for other investments? So this box is really um, aims to just talk about how you might think about why different pricing models are beneficial to you. Um, a, a percentage of sale approach might be really great for a cash-strapped food hub that recognizes the need for technology but isn't able to make a large investment up front. Um, this is to be a great way uh, for them to get started, but they should consider the fact that longer term as their sales grow, they're still going to be on this percentage of sale model, and that might impact their ability to make investments longer down the line. Um, on the flip side, uh, a perpetual user license where you pay up front for a user license and then pay ongoing maintenance fees could be great for a food hub that has access to capital to make an investment in this um, and you know doesn't want to be beholden to um, outlay of cash longer term. And then as you're thinking about the impact on your business and how well can this business in, or how well can the software solution increase your income, a couple of things to think about here are to what extent is it going to help you grow, um, grow, grow your supplier or your revenue. Maybe it helps you bring more growers online or maybe it helps you access a new pool of buyers. Um, how will it minimize your cost? So if you're doing a lot of things manually right now, you might find that a technology solution is going to significantly minimize your labor requirements through automation, so that's a cost, uh, cost benefit that you want to think through. Um, you might minimize data issues, so there could be sort of data accuracy issues that you're dealing with right now that a software solution can help address. Um, or it might help you meet regulatory requirements and customer requirements um, on things like food safety or purchasing. That could be really important and, again, help you access uh, a new base of buyers. Um, so this is a, just an initial snapshot to help you think about the return on investment approach to evaluating different software solutions and um, a software solution compared to your current status quo. And then finally, um, this is a non-comprehensive list, it's sort of a snapshot list of some of the products that are out there that could be relevant and for you guys, depending on the type of business model that you are. Um, so I've sort of categorized them into um, different ones. So ERP General is sort of a very traditional ERP software that many times these software solutions were developed not necessarily for food hubs and sometimes not even for food companies, but could be and have been in some context applied successfully to the food hub model. Um, then there's what I've called, and these are my own terms, but ERPs, or Food Hub-specific ERPs, so um, systems that have been really strategically well designed to meet the needs of Food Hubs. And the majority of these cover quite a few functions, even though they, don't all, they, don't, they may not necessarily cover every single function, they cover quite a few of them. Um, then there's this online marketplace, so uh, websites that exist to allow growers to post their inventory and allow buyers to make direct purchases. <coughs> Um, and then there's uh, software solutions that exist to support the CSA models in particular. And then there's farm systems, which may not necessarily be relevant for food hubs, um, but could be if you're doing specific types of work with your growers or if there are growers on the, on the phone that are interested in this. And then there's the function specifics. So um, there, these are different pieces of software that are going to help you with things like HR, 
with traceability, uh, with um, the EDI connection to wholesale buy or to buyers who might want some automated purchasing into your system, um, or with uh, CRM, customer relationship management, and finance. Um, so a lot of the ERP solutions actually do some of this function-specific stuff, but some of them don't. So the function-specific software is going to be important to look at as you're maybe trying to tack on, okay, what is the software solution that I'm interested in? What is it doing for me and what is it not doing for me? I might need to also go out and look for some of this function-specific software to fill those gaps. So with that, I did want to just pose a question to the group. I recognize that this is an incomplete list, so I'd love to take this time to learn from you guys if you know of any other software that's out there that's not listed here. If you guys can take a couple of seconds to share that with me, I think we'll be running a poll here. That would be really helpful. Jeff, you're a poll master. <laughs> I am. Well, uh, while we get this launched, um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, start asking some of these questions that have come in. We uh, can... Sure, we can do that. Solani, before we do into that, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Nice, uh, nice framework, I think. Just a quick ERP. Tell us what that is. Yeah, so it stands, it stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. And I'll break it down for you really simply. And so I think the easiest way to think about it is that an ERP um, software is one that addresses many aspects of what you would need. So it would address, in the context of a food hub, maybe a single ERP solution would address everything from your purchasing to your inventory management to, your, um, to the sales orders that are coming in from your buyers. And so it aims to cover multiple functions because the concept of ERP recognizes that all of these functions are interrelated and data needs to be shared amongst them. So an ERP solution addresses them all at the same time so that you don't have to be you know, taking data from one, you know, you don't have to be taking data from QuickBooks and downloading it into another piece of software in order to share that data across the system. Mm. Thank you. Okay. okay, good. We still doing the poll, Jeff? Uh, yep, people can still continue to vote. About 50% uh, have voted. Go, okay, go ahead and, and click, and then um, uh, continue to ask. There's, um, yeah, we've got some questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Loni, uh, I'm going to read this one just to make sure I get the, all the nuance to it. Uh, can startup hubs benefit from the best practices in the sector that are built into a technology platform? So you don't need to reinvent the wheel, it says, and so you can benefit from what others have learned beforehand and the tech that supports them. So can startups, hubs, benefit from the best practices in the sector that's already built into a tech platform? Yeah, I think I, think I get the question, so hopefully I'm going to answer this properly. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I think so. I mean, I think what, uh, if you looked at that last slide that I showed and I sort of described what, again, I maybe correctly or incorrectly described as sort of ERP systems that were designed specifically for food hubs. I think those systems in particular, because they were designed with food hubs in mind, would be really excellent strategic partners for startup food hubs that are just getting off the ground and trying to actually make some strategic decisions, going out and talking to those technology providers might be a really helpful way to actually gain an consolidated set of lessons from food hubs around the country because these providers are working with food hubs directly. Um, but again, I would still caution maybe on making the investment right away. Mm -hmm. I think that, that first step is a really great learning process. But um, we recognize, and I know everybody on the call, I sort of hear this time and again that um, there's great best practices nationally, but then very local context that you want to be cognizant of. And so to the extent that local context may drive slightly different decisions or large different decisions longer term than you might anticipate, it's just important, again, to get yourself off the ground and going before you put all of your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So in part, it may depend on what the what the entry cost is. If it's a low entry cost, then it might yeah. be worth engaging in that process. But if it's high, it might not be. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I also do want to be, I think it's helpful for people to understand when they think about entry costs, they should think about a combination of the actual price that they're paying as well as the degree to which they're sort of getting their their own team sort of accustomed to that system and their growers accustomed to that system. And then there's sort of like habit 
switching costs that might take place if you need to change things around um, later. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Kind of getting up to speed with the new systems always takes internal investment. Exactly. Yeah. So let me, let me yeah, results. let me just yeah, let's share these results here. Um, looks like almost half of us are have not made any investments yet, uh, but are here on this webinar to learn how to, how to go about a uh, search pro process. Um, and uh, uh, the advisors are. Uh, um, I'm, I'm glad you're all on. Um, unfortunately, after those two, uh, we have dissatisfied technology solutions with their technology solutions so uh, but at least nine percent of you are uh, pretty pretty happy with them um, with what you have so. it seems like there could be a really important next step in this just general I think initiative to sort of share out especially those who are highly satisfied with what they're doing just some tips that end users have of you know what does it take to get the right solution from their end and you know what's the right way to work effectively with their own provider. So definitely mm -hmm. exciting to know that there's some folks like that on the phone that we can reach out to. Definitely. Mm -hmm. feel, feel free to uh, write what it is that you're satisfied with um, uh, on, in the question box or you can email us contact uh, at uh, foodhub.info or contact at ngfn.org. Uh, always, uh, always like to hear uh, positive testimonials for software. So, Lonnie, I noticed you, you kind of gave us five basic business models and then gave us a couple of examples um, within those models. But what we also know is that a lot of uh, hubs are, are hybrids in a sense, but right? they're doing both direct and maybe some online mm -hmm. sales that way, as well as wholesaling. So maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, hub technology needs when they have various uh, uh, markets like that, various models. Yeah, that's a great. I mean, that is that your exact comment is why I recommend the process of doing that sort of table that I described of listing out all of your functions and describing the ideal world solution. Um, what I think is exciting is that there's enough food hubs like that that are sort of the hybrid out there that there are software solutions, um, particularly those that are designed specifically to meet the needs of food hubs that are recognizing that and that are addressing those types of needs. Um, and then, you know, there also could be an alternative solution where you're working with two different solution providers, one that's addressing a CSA business and another that's addressing your wholesale business, for example. So I think that those are, um, there are two things to consider. One, again, is that, is that one system could meet all of your needs, and then the second is that you might want to explore two systems mm -hmm. or a hybrid of a system with some um, intense sort of customization on top of it to meet your needs. Mm-hmm. All right. That's good to know. I also just want to note here, and um, I, I think technology providers can speak to this even more than I could, but what's exciting about this time and that we're in in the local food landscape is that there, because there's so much change and growth happening, there could be a lot of openness from some software providers to hear the needs of a food hub and to recognize that, okay, that might, that might, be, the, that might be true for this one food hub, but actually might be true for quite a few food hubs. So that might prompt some software providers to actually develop aspects of what the, the food hub needs because they recognize that they can also deliver that same functionality to other food hubs. So I think there's a lot of collaboration in the space and again the ability to go to a software provider with a requirements list and talk through what can and can't happen mm -hmm. is be really helpful, um, helpful for both the food hub and for the software provider. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we're in that stage where there's a lot of back and forth in co-development. That's a good point. Uh, and here's a question from uh, uh, from the audience that kind of builds on that. Uh, a little different example, but it says, uh, uh, all of us that are nonprofits have to overlay our business processes with our grant reporting and fund-based allocation payment systems. Right. So it's not necessarily two different models per se, but it's for-profit world, non-profit world, grants, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Do you have any experience you can share in also integrating our outcomes for grant tracking and separating fund categories in reports such as P&L and cash flow? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think it depends a lot on clearly what the grant metrics are. Um, I, my assumption is that many of them might be on sort of number of growers that you're working with or volume of, of products that you're bringing into the market or potentially you know, number of low-income markets that are served. Mm -hmm. I have a sense that um, there is actually quite a bit of overlap between the core business operations of the food hub and the metric that you're trying to track. So um, 
so for example, if you're trying to understand, you know, how much uh, how much volume is going into institutions such as schools and hospitals, if that's let's say a metric, then that's actually something you will need to track anyway to manage your financials. So my advice, wherever it's possible, would be um, to design your system so that you can easily extract the information you need um, in order to fill out your grant. So for example, in QuickBooks, and I know QuickBooks pretty well, so um, I'm going to use them as the first example, you can you know, categorize all of your suppliers and you can categorize all of your buyers in certain ways and so that you can easily pull out, okay, if your, your grant metrics are around a certain specific type of buyers, you can then pull out what is the business specifically that you've done with those buyers. Um, so wherever possible, again, try to design your systems in a way that, that makes, means that the way that you're tracking data is going to support your grant metrics as well. And hopefully that's also supporting your core day-to-day -day business functionality. Um, I do sort of think that there might be some instances where it's just going to have to be um, where there's some grant metrics that are completely separate and there's just going to have to be a thoughtful way to track them separately. But again, do so as much as possible where you're pulling from the data that you're already tracking in your baseline system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Uh, here's another question, and it has to do with uh, staging, I guess you'd say, and, and as growth and how you might change software over time. It says, how can I tell when it's time to move to a different software solution as my business grows? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess it depends on what investments you've already made in software. So I'm going to take, I'm going to make two, answer it in two, with two lenses. The first is that you have made sort of baseline assumptions, maybe your baseline investments, maybe you're just using a QuickBooks and a Salesforce or something like that. So you've made some investments, but not too many. Um, that's the case where I would say that the two trigger points to me are either there's so much time being allocated to the management of what, you know, of, of a system that you haven't invested that much in. So maybe, like I said, you're using QuickBooks, but it's sort of onerous, and you have a bunch of Excel spreadsheets, and those are really onerous. And not only that, you're also having some data it tracking issues, and you're not able to accurately report on things. Like that's that's an important step that might trigger the investment in in software. Um, and then the second would be um, that you know maybe you're actually being hindered that you can't access certain buyers because of your software, but those buyers would be ready and willing to purchase from you except your systems aren't in place. So those are two really important trigger points um, that I would say, again, after your baseline operations and strategy have been developed and you feel like you're either already are or, or, or are on track to become financially solvent, then those two things are true, then those are the two trigger points, I might say, and would lead you to do a search like this. Um, if you have already made some large-scale investments in um, this enterprise resource planning type of software or a full solution, and I would actually say that well before you go and look for a new software solution, I would engage in some great dialogue with the pro provider that you're already working with to see what can be done. Because again, we've described some of the pricing and behavioral switching costs that might be associated with moving to a new platform if you already made those investments. So I would first engage in, in that conversation to see if you can get the solution, the provider, to upgrade it to the extent that you need it to, to get to a point where you can still continue using them for your growth. Yeah, yeah. So get the most out of what you've already invested in, and then make that switch. Kind of uh, building upon one thing you said there, and help me understand this a little bit. You said something around integrating, or um, if the if the service systems were in place, the buyers might be willing to buy from you. Is that about just having tracking there, or is it more about integrating, uh, say, a hub system with a buyer system? Yeah, I think. I mean, there could be a couple of things there. It could be first that. I mean, it could be as baseline as, like, you don't actually have an eye towards your supply as well as you need to, so you are not comfortable selling to a new buyer, so that's one. The other could be, you know, food safety and traceability, and maybe um, there's a way that software can help you meet some of those uh, customer requirements that will then allow you to get into a new level of buyer base. Um, and then some of the large-scale wholesale buyers have, you know, oftentimes would would look for sort of EDI, so the electronic data interface, which is a fancy word, but basically just is um, the ability for those wholesale buyers to make purchases directly from you through their own system, so they don't have to make calls to you separately. Um, and that you know might be that's going to be true for some of your larger distributors and broadliners. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the types of things that again might come up in your buyer conversations or in your sales and marketing conversations that 
you know, if you really feel like you're missing the boat on some large opportunities because your software systems aren't in place, that can be a really important trigger for you. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk, there's a number of questions in here about, about costs. So let's talk a little bit about costs. And I know, you know, it's all probably fairly site-specific uh, or, or organization-specific or product-specific. Um, but it can be a it can be a costly fair or it can't be a costly fair, and then, as like you said, there's internal costs in terms of adoption. So, what do we know about any industry standards or expectations, say at early phase or mid or late stage development of a hub? What can you tell us about what people might expect to see as they go through the course of their growth? Oh my goodness, this is a question I was fearing that I would get because I know. don't want to make any like broad claims about what the pricing structure would be. Um, I'm going to try to answer it, but be diplomatic and also recognize the fact that, you know, cost is going to change, is they're going to be very much dependent on exactly what your, your needs are. Yeah. Um, but maybe I can talk through sort of two different, um, two different models and what sort of baseline cost might be. So um, there's that per user licensing model. Um, and that's the model generally where you know, you're getting a software system deployed onto the, you know onto your desktop, and maybe you get you get five user licenses, um, and you're going through a customization process and a training process, and then an ongoing maintenance is going to be part of that. Um, those types of systems are on the order of um, let's say anywhere from this is such a broad range, but let's say ten to thirty-five, forty thousand dollars in upfront fees. And then um, maybe you know anywhere from five to ten, per, yeah, let's say five to ten grand a year for maintenance and upgrades. So that's sort of the order of magnitude that we're looking at. Um, and then there's the uh, software as a subscription, sort of like a software as a service subscription model. So these are services where um, you're going to spend a monthly fee, and a lot of companies out there will scale that monthly fee based on how big you are. Um, and those could be anywhere from, I mean, I've seen I've seen them as low as you know, two hundred dollars to um, say twelve hundred dollars per month, and again, that's oftentimes going to scale based on how large you are. Um, and so, early on, you might only be spending a couple hundred bucks a month, but as you grow, you'll get to a tier where you're spending, you know, a thousand bucks a month. So, I, I'm trying not to answer it too specifically, but give you at least a broad stroke response. Yeah, you're being pretty diplomatic. <laughs> can I can I ask the question in a slightly different way? Sure. Uh, um, g given uh, the uh, the, f the fact that technology tends to uh, r reduce staff costs. Um, um, what sort of what percentage of my uh, sort of business gross revenue should I have some sense, you know, some some range for what I should be spending on uh, technology? You know, assuming that uh, with the food hub, cost of goods is something like. 60, 70 percent, and then most of the rest of that 40, to 30 to 40 percent is uh, is staff. Um, yeah, 10 percent, 5 percent. Yeah, no, it's a great question, and it's going to vary quite a bit. So there are some food hub models that are sort of e-commerce platforms at the heart and soul of what they do, and so technology is going to be a much larger portion of their budget. And then there are food hub models that are again the brick and mortar facilities where technology is truly sort of running in the background at all times, helping. Um, for the processes to flow efficiently. Um, and so as you can imagine, they're going to be really different cost of operations, uh, or sorry, percentage of operations in terms of your cost. But when we did this for Fresh Steak Kitchen and we looked at sort of what was appropriate for us to spend, we basically landed on that we don't, that we wanted to be within the 3 to 5 percent range. The, and we were the type of business that, again, technology wasn't, it was never front facing, so customers never saw technology beyond our website. Um, in a basic e-commerce platform, and technology was really supporting the background operations of our business. And I think that, that then that was based on a significant amount of benchmarking research, so it's likely a good starting point for some of those more traditional food hubs out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, I mean, you outlined a really nice process, but clearly for each, um, each function, going through that uh, could take some time and effort and require some leadership. What if someone was to hire uh, an external person? to help an organization through this or food hub through this. What would, what might one expect to pay for that? Yeah, I think that that's, um, again, I think there's different ways you can structure an engagement with an outside firm for this. I think you could, you know, could work with an outside firm to do, to be the project manager 
So this person who's going to work with your team from the beginning to end to identify your requirements list, to do all of the research, to talk to the software providers, um, and then to you know help you guys with deployment. You know, uh, um, a process like that might be a three to four month process in the um, I would say in the low to mid you know five digit range. Um, and then there could also be a way that advisory, an advisory firm or a, a, an outside counsel can come in and do a couple of steps in the process, right? So maybe they can just lead your team through a one or two day workshop where where, you, where the end of uh, that workshop is the requirements gathering process or the requirements list, that table that we described. Um, or maybe they're doing that and then also helping um, make, make the ROI decision at the end. So I think that then there's lots of ways to sort of parse out some of the key pieces of the functionality and spend quite a bit less on a consulting firm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Good. Um, just looking through questions here. A couple of uh, a comment. Uh, someone says it's, uh, in terms of, remember we talked a little bit about ex export and import data if you were to uh, work with a larger buyer and you may want to kind of connect to their systems. Someone says it's usually a very good upfront question to ask a provider what is their import-export ability of the data. And if they say they don't have one, it may not be mature enough for your needs. Any comment on that? And so were they talking about a buyer or were they talking about a... Well, a you tell me. I mean, they're talking about in importing export data ability of the software solution. So that's right. So I mean, it's, it goes back to that question of integration. So I think mm -hmm. in my I had that slide that showed about the various considerations that you want to think through, yeah. and functionality is one important piece of many, and then integration is another very important piece. So to what extent, as as this co comment astutely talked about, is data easily it can be easily imported and then um, shared with the buyers or growers on you know, either side of the supply chain. And also, again, how easily, how easily can it be um, imported, exported and then imported into other systems you might be using. So a lot of food hubs that I spoke to, um, again, are using an interesting software, an ERP system, but then still use QuickBooks to manage their financials. And so it's really important that there's ideally an API, which is um, in, in sort of a a very seamless integration of data between that system and QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically that means that they don't have to do any manual labor in order to export and import data into, into oh, the right. and that it just happens. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the ideal scenario is, again, this API that's doing the direct integration between your main system and all the other systems you and your buyers need to use. Um, and then, you know, if that's not possible, then the next level of desirability would be that data is very easily exported and then can be very easily emailed or sent or uploaded into the system that you need to integrate with. All right. That's helpful. That's helpful. Uh, open sourced software for these kind of things. I mean, we see open sourced in a lot of different sectors. I think, I think there may be some here, and I know, we're start, I know people are developing some. Pros and cons? Any thoughts on open source software? Yeah, I'm not a I'm not somebody who has like dramatic opinions either way. I think it's it touched on a couple of the pros and cons. I, I mean, I think that that open source, if and when it became really large in the local food system landscape. I mean, maybe backing up, it's sort of the it's like the Google versus Apple debate, right? So Google is um, their their platform is open source, and that has led to that people people believe that it leads to the development of um, you know far more apps and interesting uh, pieces of development around that software. So that same thing could be true in the local food movement, that if mm -hmm. you have an open source system, not only can that happen, but also you know, a lot of the work that we're doing in this space is mission-oriented, and there could be a philosophical belief that um, by being open source that you're um, helping to uh, scale and improve and support the local food movement maybe more rapidly than a closed system would be. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a lot of the pros on the open source side. Um, that said, on the closed systems, I think that there's a very legitimate reason why software providers decide to be closed. It, it protects themselves, and it means that they can maybe um, secure funding that they need to. It may protect their profitability and their own um, IP longer term. And you know, I think that if we have a local food system with quite a few uh, closed and competitive um, software providers out there that are helping the needs of the local food system, that's also a really 
that's also a great way to build a system. So I'm, I'm, I don't really pick sides in that debate, but I think that um, a food hub may have a philosophical desire to be part of one or the other, or may have a strategic desire, again, to, I think probably from a strategic standpoint, the most important is that, you know, there's a belief that open source, um, if it's widespread, that there, um, there might be more functionality and applications that are developed around it. Um, and on the closed system side, oftentimes you might have sort of cleaner business relationships with the vendor that you're working with, and you might perceive that they're going to be more stable and around longer because those closed systems tend to be able to secure funding more easily. Yeah. All right. That's a good list. Okay. Last question because I know we're heading into home plate here. Uh, where do you see the sector going? I mean, what kind of innovations do you see out there? What kind of um, out-of-the-box things are starting to come? You know, if if, uh, if you were to stand back and say, and look at the evolution of this, and the food sector and the software needs that it has, and, and what we're seeing in that space, any any future predictions? Oh my God, that's a really hard one. Let me think for a second. You know, I figured with an MBA, you know, we can. Give questions. <laughs> I know. No, you should. I just haven't. I didn't really give it as much thought. Um, you know, I well, I guess my first statement actually could be that I I think that there might be some interesting movement in the open source space and the local food system. So that would in the, and I, I'm assuming your question is on the tech side of the local. Food yeah. System. Yep. Um. So you know that could be really interesting. Um. I also think that you know as I said earlier, there's quite a few uh, food hub specific pieces of functionality out, or pieces of software out there um, that they are, they have been developing sort of alongside the development of the food hub model itself. And so you're, you'll oftentimes find that when you're deploying the software to your specific food hub, there's quite a bit of functionality and customization that needs to happen. And I, I think that the most exciting thing will be that over time, there will be like very literally off-the-shelf solutions that food hubs can just say, okay, this is for me, this is for me, this is for me, because there'll be enough settling, I guess, in the business model. So food hubs will there'll be you know a set of maybe 10 to 15 very specific types of food hub models that shake out, and the software companies that are out there will develop very specifically to meet those models' needs. Whereas right now, what you see is that either food hubs are trying to um, adapt. Uh, like a very traditional ERP solution to meet their needs, so a solution that's actually being used for you know, a large produce distributor to meet their needs, and that's really challenging. Um, or they're working with a startup, um, startup software provider themselves, and that software provider is also trying to figure it out. So I think as we move forward in this space, as the food hub models again shake out more, more consistently and concretely, it'll be just it'll be all just the easier conversation. Um, yeah. And then I would say the other is just, you know, quite a bit more sort of networking and collaboration in this space. I think um, this is one example where food hubs are all working together and with local food systems IT providers um, to be sharing lessons so that the IT platforms can be um, opportunities to share strategic lessons and not just IT. You know, that question earlier was a really insightful one about, you know, can we go to IT providers as a startup and get lessons? I think that's that would be great because mm -hmm. the IT providers are working with dozens, almost hundreds sometimes of food hubs and you know, if they can be bastions of lessons and strategic guidance, I think that would be a, a really That's good right. as well. That's right. Well, Saloni, this has been great. Uh, both the framework and, and the insights and what you see and the response to some of the particular questions I think has been really helpful to folks. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank I you would, very much. This is great. I would like to second that. Thank you. All right. Um, and uh, and let people know about uh, some upcoming opportunities. I, I, I hope this webinar has given you the tools to set you on the course to properly s select the software that will assist you to run the most efficient business you can. I want to point out three work resources that you can tap into. Uh, each one of these in the po uh, just after the after the webinar ends uh, your browser will open up with a post webinar survey uh, each of these resources you, you can let us know that you're interested and we can give you more information in that post webinar survey so uh, uh, please let us know uh, w one is that wholesome wave food hub business assessment toolkit what that was mentioned um, this tool is in there are several other fantastic tools for emerging operational hubs as well as uh, those uh, who are considering investing uh, in food hub businesses. Um, 
So uh, also, uh, you can request information about hiring new venture advisors to assist your business through this uh, tech assessment selection process. And they uh, have several other skills and lots of experience with a variety of food hubs, fantastic uh, consultants. Uh, the post-webinar survey, uh, there's a, an option there. Uh, and finally, uh, there's uh, you all. Um, we have a Food Hub community of practice, uh, and uh, there's an associated listserv Google group. Uh, let us know that uh, if you're interested in becoming a part of that, and we'll, we'll let you know how. Um, so three, three great resources. Uh, and I guess a fourth, this webinar is uh, recorded, it's being recorded. It's going to be archived on our uh, ngfn.org uh, website, along with the over 50 other webinars we've done in the past. Uh, feel free to send others you think you'd like to have heard this presentation and take some professional development time yourself. Dig through our excellent archives, ngfn.org slash webinars. This webinar should be up within a few business days, uh, and our webinars are organized into topics if you lift, look in the left-hand navigation area. So if, uh, if you're into food hubs, uh, that's one of, the, one of the topic areas. We do offer these uh, webinars on the third Thursday of each month. Uh, for those of you keeping track, this is the fourth Thursday. Um, we, we know, uh, but usually it's the third Thursday. Uh, and in August, uh, we're going to bring you a brand new tool developed by Farm Credit of the Virginias and Farm Credit Council uh, as food hubs and other good food businesses, including uh, farms, uh, require more equipment to run their operations. More decisions have to be made about uh, leasing or buying or perhaps outs outsourcing. Uh, designed for helping food hubs to find the correct trucking and transport solution, this tool can also be adapted to other capital intensive equipment decisions. We'll also feature uh, Corbin Hill Food Project. Um, they, uh, they tried uh, renting, they tried, uh, uh, or rather leasing, they tried buying uh, and decided uh, in the end it's most efficient to, uh, to use a, a third party distributor. Uh, so uh, hear that story, it's very interesting. Uh, according to the 2013 National Food Hub Survey, the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems conducted in collaboration with us, the Wallace Center, on average, food hub managers have between one and five years of experience across uh, the essential skills of food hub management. Several of the key challenges noted by a significant number of hubs focused on management and staffing issues. As a response, a team of experienced food hub professionals worked with the University of Vermont to create the first higher ed certificate program in the U.S. focused on food hub management. 25 students will have the opportunity to begin the 10-month program in uh, January. Through a blend of hands-on community-based online and on-campus learning, this one-of-a-kind professional certificate program prepare, prepares leaders for effective management of food hubs and sustainable food value chains. There are only 25 spaces, so if you're interested, inquire now at learn.uvm.edu slash food hub. The, the URL is up there. Uh, the NGFN is on YouTube, on Twitter, and of course we have our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is also on Facebook. Come like us. You can search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. Uh, and if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. Uh, there's a link on the ngfn.org homepage. You can also let us know, I believe, on the post-webinar survey. We'll, we can sign you right up. Uh, many of you have signed up uh, when you registered for this webinar. Contact us at any time. Our email address is contact at ngfn.org. And the NGFN would like to thank uh, Saloni and uh, you for your time today. Again, let me encourage you to fill out that uh, post webinar survey. It should open in your web, web browser in just a moment. And this concludes the webinar. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>